Welcome to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. Here you'll find the intersection between faith and mental health. I'm your host, Camille. I'm a licensed therapist and clinical social worker, but more importantly, I'm a Christian who really loves the Lord. And I'm just trying to navigate this life without falling victim to it, just like everyone else. Here we take a faith-based approach to all things mental health and wellness, because the Bible tells us to guard our heart and mind. And sometimes we need a little bit of help with that. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. I'm your host, Camille, and as always, I am very, very happy that you are here. I hope that you're doing well. I hope that your week is going well, that you are meeting your goals and taking care of yourself. I'm trying my best. (laughs) I hope you are too. (laughs) Um, So today, I want to get into a topic uh, that I think is something that everybody struggles with on one level or another, whether or not we're aware of it. But uh, today I want to talk about pride, humility, ego, um, and narcissism a little bit. Just a little bit. Don't get too excited about this narcissism. This is one of those kind of buzzwords and like trendy mental health things. Everyone is diagnosing everybody with narcissism. Uh, Everyone is not a narcissist, but I do want to talk about some of the narcissistic traits that can show up in anyone, whether or not you're clinically diagnosed, because some of those traits have to do with a lot of the pride that we have to fight with and struggle with as Christians. So when we hear the term narcissist or we think about someone who we feel is narcissistic, the main thing that comes to mind is someone who is kind of obsessed with themselves. They think very highly of themselves and primarily they feel like they are better than other people. Now, there are three kind of main components to uh, clinical narcissism, and those are self-importance, grandiosity, and a lack of empathy for other people. Now, let me say this before we go any further. You can have narcissistic traits without having narcissistic personality disorder. This is an important distinction to make because we throw out these terms all willy nilly and it can be kind of harmful if we don't have the right information about it. And we're talking about personality disorders versus just having a trait of something. Then that is putting a uh, a label on something um, and it's something to really kind of identify people by. And we don't really want to do that. And we're quick to jump to those conclusions. Honestly, we do the same thing with OCD. We do the same thing when we say that we are antisocial. If y'all really knew what some of these terms meant, we may not be so quick to throw them out. Same thing with narcissism. So let's make that distinction first and foremost. But I do want to talk about some of the traits that are involved in that personality disorder. Someone can be narcissistic without being a narcissist or without having narcissistic personality disorder. In order to have any kind of mental health diagnosis, you have to meet the diagnostic criteria, meaning that there's a list of symptoms and behaviors for every single diagnosis. And you have to have a certain amount of those in order to meet criteria for the diagnosis. And you need to have what's called a functional impairment, which means that this thing that you're struggling with, it has to impair your life. It has to disrupt your life in some way. It has to make it difficult for you to function at work, at home, in your relationships. It has to make it hard for you to think clearly, anything like that. If it does not disrupt any of those things for you, if you're able to go about your life as normal without any disruption specifically from this thing, then you don't have that diagnosis. Okay. (laughs) All right. I had to just get in my educational bag for a second because the way we throw some of these terms around can be pretty harmful. And I think that we need to do our due diligence to make sure that we are accurately using the appropriate language. The words that we use, there's power in the tongue, and we we all know that. So uh, think about someone in your life, or it, it might even be you, okay? You might be the person in your life. Think about someone in your life who you might consider to have a really big ego or to be very prideful and maybe even very arrogant. Now, when we talk about pride and ego and arrogance, we also have to talk about shame because pride and shame are two sides of the same coin. For folks who are incredibly arrogant and maybe narcissistic, maybe have some narcissistic traits, oftentimes that comes from a deep-suited trauma, from a traumatic rejection that they experienced or a traumatic abandonment that they experienced. And when you are hurt in that way, then we develop a lot of insecurities right? When you've been rejected or abandoned, 
the message is that it's your fault and that you did something and there was something wrong with you and that's why it happened. And so it makes you feel very, very vulnerable. We've all been rejected in one way or another. It never feels good, never feels good at all. And we we make this kind of vow to ourselves that like, I'm never gonna let anyone make me feel that way again. And sometimes that is what develops into this really uh, grandiose and high opinion of yourself because the alternative is to be in a position where you are vulnerable enough to allow people to reject you again. And so there are some people, and it again, it might even be you, when we're rejected, we want to develop this kind of nonchalant attitude about things. We try not to care so that it won't hurt as much if we're rejected again. So many times people say, oh, I don't care. You do. <laughs> You very much do care. You don't want to care because you don't want to be in a position where you could be hurt in that way again. But we develop this kind of nonchalant attitude about things and we develop a pretty deep rooted aversion to vulnerability. Vulnerability is a lot of people's biggest fear. We just may not call it that. But for a lot of us, that is our biggest fear. And so when you have been rejected on a grand scale, or in a very, very painful way. It feels incredibly vulnerable because it really feels like your livelihood and your well being and your personhood is in the hands of someone else and you don't know what they're gonna do with it. But also, depending on the context of that rejection, when and how it took place, that rejection might have told you who you are, who you believe you are. It might have it might have inserted some truths, not even some truths, some untruths, some negative beliefs about yourself and who you are. And then we tend to internalize those. Now, let me also say this, right? This is coming from someone who used to be incredibly insecure. And as a result of that, I now have a pretty high opinion of myself. And I really had to figure out how to how to balance that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about it later. Y'all know I, I just be exposing myself on this podcast. <laughs> But I know firsthand that a lot of times when we struggle with pride and ego, it's because of deep-rooted insecurities. And it's because of the shame that we want to run from, that we want to cover up, that we never want to see again. And so we go so far in the other direction that we become this prideful and egotistical and sometimes even arrogant person. And the thing is, that we stray and we hide from vulnerability because it feels weak. But when you think about it, moving towards arrogance instead of embracing vulnerability is actually the weaker thing to do. We become so protective and dependent on our image and how we're perceived by other people that that really becomes the driving force for a lot of what we do. We are so afraid of allowing people to have an opinion of us that maybe is negative. But when you think about it, like what's the actual harm in someone having an opinion of you that's not the greatest? You're not going to be for everybody and everybody's not going to be for you. We know that. That's true. But that feels like the most dangerous place to be for some of us. So we go to all these lengths and we develop this skin and this wall, this defense mechanism so that we don't have to be in that position ever again. The most arrogant people that you know are the most insecure people because it turns into seeking this external validation all the time because the rejection happened on an external level. And so now the validation needs to happen on an external level. But as long as you are basing what you believe about yourself um, and you are basing your worth on the validation that you get from other people, it will always be incredibly fragile and you'll stay insecure. We, we, We can't rely on other people to tell us really anything about ourselves and who we are. Well, I don't know. We, because we do need to be open sometimes to feedback from people who are close to us and people who love us. But when we're seeking external validation, it's from everybody, not just from those who are close to us and not just from our safe people, but it's from everybody. So when we put so much emphasis on our accomplishments, on what we've done, on how we look on how we are perceived, how much people like us, how many followers we have, how many subscribers we have. We allow those external things to tell us our value. And as long as our value is connected to those things, it's going to be so fickle. 
very, very, very fickle. And beyond that, it's going to perpetuate this pride and ego that makes it so that we are not open to actual growth and to actual evolution. When we talk about healing and personal growth and personal reflection, that's a vulnerable place to be. And if you have developed this defense mechanism that is so thick and so strong that you are not willing to go to some of those vulnerable places within you, that's why we keep throwing out the term narcissist, but a narcissist is not going to go to therapy. (laughs) They're not seeking help for themselves because they're not willing to go to those vulnerable places. They've convinced themselves that those vulnerable places don't exist. They have developed this lack of empathy because everything is about self-preservation. Everything is about making sure that I am not in that position again to ever feel vulnerable. And so over time, that kind of self-preservation really kind of, it really morphs into, into this superiority and shifts our perspective on what we think is important and who we think is important. For folks who are actually clinically diagnosed with narcissism, And I'm not going to go through all the symptoms and everything right now because y'all going to run around diagnosing everybody and throwing it around to everybody that you see. We're not about to do that. But there, know that there are uh, some qualities that have to do with um, believing that you are better than everyone else, that uh, you have that that you have more capabilities, and that other people cannot even begin to understand the depth of your knowledge or the depth of your capabilities uh, and that they will never be able to to reach your level, Um, using people to get what you want and what you need, not really being able to empathize with what anybody else is going through. Somehow it's going to come back to you. And so if we're not careful, then that pride that we develop as a protective mechanism can develop into something that can be really harmful to our relationships and to ourself. We have to be willing to go to the vulnerable places that exist within us because they're still there. Ignoring them does not get rid of them. But over time, we get so good. We get so good at deflecting, at projecting, at suppressing. We get so, so good at pushing all of those things away and pushing all of them back. When we don't look at them for a long time, then we do start to even convince ourselves that they don't exist and that there really is nothing that I'm avoiding. But really, there's just a, there's just a ton of avoidance going on there, but it's because of the shame that we have felt. And we want to push the shame as far back in the closet as we can. We want to put it in a box and tape it up and put it in the basement and just never go and look at it again. But when we do that, it it starts to kind of create, it, it starts to rot us a little bit from the inside. And so when we say that shame and pride are two sides of the same coin, they really tend to go hand in hand. Now, the cure for all of this or the way to overcome that type of pride and ego is to embrace vulnerability because vulnerability leads to humility. Being vulnerable or accepting your your own vulnerabilities just means that you're acknowledging your humanity. I'll never stop talking about this. Acknowledging your humanity and the fact that you are not perfect Now, what that brings up for you when I say that is going to speak to the parts of you that maybe still need some healing and to the parts of you that you might do well to spend some time with digging a little bit deeper in and you've got some things to unpack. But vulnerability leads to humility. And if we have a really hard time with some corners of our mind and of our life that we don't really like to look at, then that also says that we have an issue with self-acceptance. There's a big part of this that has to do with self-acceptance. And that might sound a bit like ironic or backwards as we say it, because in order to work through pride and ego, we need to get to a place of self-acceptance. But that's really what it is. When, when you lead with that ego and when you lead with that pride, what that looks like is leading with the parts of you that you think are going to be accepted by other people. It's leading with the parts of you that you deem to be valuable or worthy, or actually is leading with the parts of you that you think other people will deem value and and worthy or valuable and worthy. 
And in that, in doing that, we give other people so much power, which is why I don't see it as a, as a strength, but more of, of a weakness. It's scary to be vulnerable and to let people see you in that way because we give them so much power over it because we wonder what are they going to think about it? How are they going to feel about it? Are they going to reject me because of it? Are they going to abandon me because of it? We give other people so much power so much power. And I don't believe that there is strength in that. So we want to run away from vulnerability because it feels weak, but embracing vulnerability is the strongest thing that you can do. Embracing the the broken parts of you and the parts of you that have endured the most suffering, that's embracing the strongest parts of you and the parts of you that are the most resilient. There's no weakness in that. That's such a myth. That is such a myth and a misnomer. And we really have to unlearn that. We have to unlearn that so that we can really embrace the vulnerability that makes you strong. It's a beautiful thing to be able to sit with the softness within you and say that this exists as a result of something that I endured through. It's the endurance that developed this this softer side of you. The side of you that makes you more gentle or the side of you that makes you more compassionate or the side of you uh, that that maybe makes you a little bit scared sometimes. The side of you that makes you uh, aware of what other people are thinking and feeling. This is going to also go back to like perspective, right? There are parts of ourselves that maybe we we don't love or haven't loved. And maybe it's because of how we view those parts of ourselves. I mentioned that I, I, was, I was really insecure for a long time and now... I'm, I'm way less insecure. I think anyone who knows me personally would say that I'm pretty sure of myself and and pretty confident, generally speaking. And it's not that I have changed so much as a person, the things about myself that used to make me insecure, I found a way to accept them. And beyond that, I found a way to embrace and appreciate those parts of myself. It's so funny. I was, I was talking with my sister a couple of weeks ago, um, because I, I really do have to check my ego and like pride is something that, that I um, am constantly, you know, kind of working through and and really trying to find some balance there um, and praying about, because I know that if it goes unchecked, it could develop into this like superiority complex and this like self-righteousness that I really don't want to create any room for. But I was talking to my sister about how I didn't used to think so highly of myself. And now I do think pretty highly of myself. And I remember saying to her, it really was an overcorrection. <laughs> it really was an overcorrection. It came from not feeling great about myself, not feeling that valuable or, or that worthy uh, and feeling like people didn't like me and just getting to a place of accepting that there are things about myself that I cannot change and that are inherently parts of, of who I am. And when I stopped trying to pressure myself to be something different is when I stopped caring what other people thought of those things in me that can't change. Why care what you think about this if it can't change? This skin is brown, baby. It's brown. Okay. Feel how you want to feel about it. It's not changing. It's one of those kind of things, right? I have a very loud laugh. When I cackle, it's, it's loud. Like, don't take me to the movies. Um, It's, (laughs) It's loud. It's not changing. It's not changing. I can try to have a cute little petite little laugh as much as I want. I can't do it. It's not changing. So if you don't like my laugh, sorry. Sorry, not sorry. It's not going anywhere, right? So I got to a place where I accepted all those parts of me and really allowed people the, the space to accept it or reject it. That's your prerogative. But that don't have nothing to do with me. I think I... I let go of the responsibility that I felt to control how other people saw me. And that made me more secure in who I am. And that's a really beautiful thing. And so, especially as Christians, right? We want to find this, we have to find this balance between, uh, being considerate and caring for other people and serving other people, right? The Bible tells us to consider others higher than ourselves, but that does not mean that we consider ourselves as nothing or that we consider ourselves as uh, unworthy or unvaluable. And so when you also accept the, the inherent value that you have, right? We have to make sure that it does not develop into this self-righteousness because what happens when you get to that place of self-acceptance is that it makes it really easy for you to see other people who have not accepted parts of themselves. 
And you can have compassion and empathy for them because I know what it, what it feels like to not be able to accept yourself in that way. And that can turn into judgment. I have had to check myself. I've had to check myself because I've caught myself uh, comparing myself to other people, not from a place of deficit, but from a place of uh, self-righteousness. And that's not godly at all, at all. One of the main reasons that we need to talk about this is because uh, one of the three main categories of sin is pride of life. All sin falls under one of three categories, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That pride of life, that's what we're talking about now is that self-righteousness It's that entitlement that comes with the self-righteousness. It is the, the ego that comes with it. It's the belief that develops that we are better, stronger, more intelligent, whatever than anybody else. You can accept and love and have value for yourself without deterring somebody else or without taking away from somebody else's value. Now this, that, that, that's a part of the issue, right? Is that when we develop a sense of pride in order to overcompensate for our insecurities, then it is imperative that we feel better than other people. It's imperative that we place ourselves on a pedestal higher than other people, because other people are the ones who determine our value and determine our worth. So if someone else is better than us, then what that tells us is that we are not as good or that we are less valuable. So really do some self-reflection. If, if you, uh, struggle with, with pride or ego, and even there's a, there's a humility in even saying that I struggle with pride and with ego. It took me a while to even accept that about myself, but you have to humble yourself enough to know that this is something actually that comes up for me, even if it's just internal. I, I, it's, it's so funny because like there's, there's, there's a duality here, right? Because internally I feel great about myself, but externally, I know that everyone else doesn't. That's how I, <laughs> that's how I got to feel so good about myself was accepting the fact that other people don't. And I'm not really under any illusion that that has necessarily changed. I don't think that people hate me necessarily, but I do not think that everyone is going to like me or that everyone is going to love me and they don't have to, and they don't have to. So because of that, I try my best to carry myself in a way uh, that does not assume that uh, other people are going to find me as valuable as I believe that I am. Now, God, if this ain't a healthy place to be, then reveal it to me. But that's how I try to keep some balance with it, right? I think I'm great. <laughs> Everybody ain't gonna think I'm great. Everybody don't have to think I'm great. That does not take away from the greatness that I believe is in me. But I'm going to allow people the space to make up their mind about that. And that's fine. That that really is fine. It doesn't take away from me. It doesn't take away from you. It doesn't take away from, from anybody. So I try to have enough humility to know that just because I think that I'm great, everybody else is not going to. And they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Because you are allowed to decide how you feel about people. Absolutely. You are allowed to decide that. But if we haven't really come to that conclusion, right? If I still had some of these same insecurities, and let me say that I still have insecurities. I, I, I still have insecurities, but they don't, they, they don't dictate how I feel about myself. They don't, they don't dictate my value or, or my worth anymore in the way that they used to. Praise God. Praise God for that deliverance. Because if you have been there, then you know what kind of jail that really is. And that really feels like when you, when your insecurities are the, are your, uh, like defining factors, whether other people know it or not, other people may not know that that's your defining factors, but you know it, you know it. And you have to live with that. You know it and God knows it. So even if you present as a much more confident person, you know, that deep down, you're really not. I don't think I ever presented as somebody who was incredibly insecure. Oh, but I absolutely was. I absolutely was. Oh, I know that I was overcompensating and I know that I was trying to gain the admiration of other people and I was seeking external validation. I listen, I know where I come from. Okay. And I thank God for the deliverance and for getting me to where I am now. But you know, I think that we have to be careful sometimes with the blessings uh, that, that God has given us because if we don't steward them well, 
if we don't steward them properly, then they can become something that is a barrier in our relationship with God. I'm so grateful that he has delivered me from that insecurity and has really allowed me to step into a form of self-acceptance and self-love that says, I know who I am because God made me this way. He made me this way on purpose. And I'm grateful for every single thing that he has placed in me. I'm grateful for all of it. I want to steward that well so that that does not turn into a level of self-importance and self-righteousness and superiority that says that God made me special and he didn't make you special. That's when it becomes more of a problem because that's not at all the case. And so if we don't steward it properly and if we allow that to uh, to still define us and if we now present to people in a way that says, I'm great, I know that I'm great. And if you don't know that I'm great, then there's something wrong with you. Then the the acceptance and validation that God has given you is now leading you into sin. And we have to be very aware of this because the pride of life shows up all over the place in in so many different ways. If you look throughout the Bible, all of the kings, all of the kings in the Bible had had to deal with their pride at one point or another. And it was the downfall of most of them. Your pride will be your downfall because it makes you believe that you don't need God. And it makes you feel entitled to tell God what to do and how to do it. Uh, It makes you feel like you get to uh, say yes or no to what God is is wanting to do in your life. And it's going to be your downfall if you let it. Because then instead of listening for the voice of God, you listen for the voice of other people who are saying what you want to hear. And that's a dangerous place to be. When that pride goes unchecked, it will lie to you and tell you that you don't need God. And it will make you forget God's position and who he actually is. It'll make you forget that God is the one who's actually in charge and in control and making decisions. And that he is the only one who is really capable of making those kind of decisions. Think about the devil. Why did he fall? Remember that he used to be an angel and it was his pride that made him fall. Look how far he fell. Okay. Let's learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> Let's not make the same mistake. But that pride will tell you that God's position is optional and it's very much not. When you start to believe that, it's a dangerous game you're playing. And when you start to believe that you become further and further away from God, and that's the kind of sin that will cause God to take his hand from you, that will cause God to leave you to your own devices. I don't, I don't want to be there. I don't want God to leave me to my own devices. And so we have to have enough humility to know that I need to always be keeping myself in check. I need to have enough humility to know uh, that if I'm not careful, that this pride could really lead to sin. And I don't want that. I don't want that. And so we are always needing to make sure that we're aligning ourselves with God's word and his power and his authority in our life. So if at at any point you find that you're wanting to like go a different way, even though God is saying to go this way and you think that you know better than him, okay, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you because it's not going to be pretty. When God has to remind you who he is, not only do we reject God's authority and position in our life when we allow our pride to grow and fester, but we're no longer listening to other people. We're no longer listening and seeking wise counsel, right? Now, this is one of those things that we need to have some balance with as well, because other people shouldn't be able to tell us who we are, but people who are close to us and who are safe should be able to give us feedback, should be able to help correct us when they see us veering off path, right? The Bible tells us to seek wise counsel and to keep like-minded people around us for a reason because we're running this race together. But when that pride gets so deep rooted, then you believe that nobody is even on your level enough to be able to tell you anything. And so we don't listen to what other people are saying. We're not listening to God. We're not listening to other people. We are creating an island that we're on alone. Talk about isolation. That's a different kind of isolation than we usually talk about. But that is its own kind of of isolation. You're creating an island for yourself because you think that nobody else is good enough to be on the island with you. Excuse me, please, please. Read the book of Proverbs. (laughs) Read the book of Proverbs. I, you know, I really should have looked up the, the numbers. How many times in Proverbs does God warn us against 
pride and he talks about the proud and he says that pride leads to to destruction right uh and and evil and there's just all the 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 comparison and the dichotomy between the proud and the humble uh, and that he rewards the humble and the meek and the lowly and that those who are proud and haughty that that leads to destruction and that that leads to sin and that leads to evil over and over and over and over again there is a reason that Jesus came to earth in the way that he did. There is a reason that he came with the humility that he did. And that's why they didn't believe him. They didn't believe him because he was so humble, right? Because people expected him. If you're God, if you're the Messiah, then you ought to be in the, you know, the, the, the grandest and just the most uh, elegant and high standing person. And no one should be able to reach you because you're so superior. That's what they were expecting. When he did not come that way, he really shook up their expectation of him. But that was on purpose. Jesus' whole story, the way that he came into this earth and the way that he walked among this earth, the way that he died was always wrapped in humility. Everything that he did was from a humble spirit. And if that is our example, then we need to include that part of it as well. We need to include that part of it as well. When God puts us in these positions and he gives us these gifts to be used for his glory, we have to remember and reset sometimes. Remember that it is for his glory and not for our own. Reset, reset before God has to reset and humble you, okay? It says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. We're not doing any of that. Anything that God allows me to have is a, is, is a grace and is a gift. It's not of my own doing. It's not. I think that's why sometimes God takes us through these things and he puts us in these positions where we are so like desolate and destitute. And it's just like, God, I don't know how I got here or how I'm going to get out of here. Because when we do get out of, out of here, when we do get to the other side of it, he is supposed to get the glory. If everything happened the way that you thought it was going to happen. And if everything happened uh, the way that you planned it out, then at the end of it, who's getting the glory? You're going to say, yeah, look at all of what I did. I'm, I did these accomplishments. I got this, uh, this career and this house and this car and this family. And it, it was me and we're not acknowledging any of God and all of that. But when he takes you low so that he could take you high, then you know that you can't take any credit for that. And you know that God is the one to be glorified through that. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're, everything that we do is to glorify God and not ourselves. But if we can be honest, sometimes it feels good. Accolades feel good for other people to say you're doing so well. That feels great. Look, we, you know, we talk a lot about external validation and how we shouldn't need it and we shouldn't and we don't, but it feels good. It feels good. And sometimes we want it, but when we chase it, that's when it becomes a problem. That's when it becomes a problem. Getting compliments feels nice. For me, at least. I know a lot of people have a hard time accepting compliments because of those insecurities. But when people see your value without you having to go out of your way to like show it to them, that feels good. It does. But that cannot be the driving force behind anything. If that becomes a driving force, then we have got off track and we have a problem on our hands. That cannot be the motivation for anything. Let that be the cherry on top, not the whole Sunday. If other people's acceptance and validation is the whole thing, if that's the reason, if that's the whole Sunday, then you've already lost the plot because you're not doing it for God anymore. You're doing it for other people. You're doing it for other people and not for God. Let me tell you, I've been so just grateful and in awe with the response that I've gotten from this podcast because I wasn't thinking about that. When I started it, I started it because I felt the Holy Spirit told me to do it and I felt called to do it. I listen, when I had got like 10 little subscribers, I said, not 10 people, 10 people here listening to me. Oh, that's so amazing. That's, that, that is amazing. If I touch one person, if I touch one person, this has been a success. So for this to, to reach thousands of people, what, excuse me, I never saw that coming. That was not my expectation at all. And I don't believe this because of me at all, at all. 
This is only because of God. Any success that I find here is because God deemed it to be so. And because he's the one who is making it happen. Y'all should see me trying to think of of these episodes sometimes. Sometimes I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. And I always have to ask God for inspiration and to speak to me and to give me some direction and to tell me what it is that he wants me to tell his people. It is not of me at all. And I have to remind myself of that even because it feels good. When I saw the response and that people were really, that people were really uh, responding well to this podcast, of course that felt good because it's something that I care about so much. And I have to make sure that, and God continues to humble me through it as well. But, and and I'm grateful for that because otherwise I think it, it could be easy to get a big head about getting a positive response from a lot of people. It can be easy to get a big head about that, but God continues to humble me and I'm grateful for it because I do not want to become so prideful and so arrogant that I lose the plot and that I, I and that I lose sight of what this is really about and who this is really about. I pray that that, that, that never happens. And I pray that I stay close enough to God for him to continue to humble me as often as I need it over and over again. That might be a dangerous prayer to pray because getting humble don't always feel good. It's like when they say like, okay, you ask for patience, then you already know that God's going to take you through some things to make you patient. But any fruit of the spirit, I think it comes from work. It comes from pruning, right? Fruit doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's a long and arduous process sometimes. And sometimes it's really stagnant before you see anything, before you see any fruit. And so even in in my humility, that is a fruit that I'm wanting to produce. And I understand there might be some pruning that comes along with that. But I try to humble myself enough to know that I'm not above correction. I am not above reproach and that I need it just as much as other people, just as much as the next person does. But that is absolutely something that I have to work through and that I have to continuously ask God to to renew me through. We are called to be servants for others, for other people. So if everything that I'm doing is about me, how is that in service to anyone else? It's not. We need to take care of ourselves and love ourselves and respect ourselves as the temple of God, as the temple for the Holy Spirit, but we have to serve other people. I take care of myself so that I can continue serving other people. That's how it has to work. And I think that's an important point to make too, because we, 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 we always kind of overcorrect and go in the opposite. We say, well, I don't want to be arrogant. So therefore I'm never going to think about myself at all. I'm never going to think about myself. Matter of fact, I hate myself. Matter of fact, I'm horrible. I'm trash because I don't want to be arrogant, but that's not what God wants either. Because if you feel like you're trash and don't deserve anything, then you're going to believe that you don't deserve God and that you don't deserve God's grace or God's mercy. And you're going to reject God's grace and God's mercy. And then you're isolated from him in that way, right? But if you go too far in the other direction, then we're so prideful and so arrogant and we allow that pride of life to lie to us. And we allow the pride of life to lead us into sin. Then we're isolated too. So a lot of these concepts are about finding that middle ground, which is where God is right? He is, it's not, it's not one or the other. It's not one or the other. We need to accept ourselves enough to know and believe and relish in the fact that God loves me, which says that there must be something in me that is lovable. God loves me. Therefore I am lovable, period. Even if I don't feel it in that moment, even if other people have not validated that for me, God loves me. Therefore I'm lovable. What am I going to call God a liar by saying I'm not lovable? There's nothing to love about me. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because in that case, if I'm calling God a liar, then I'm saying that I know more than God. And so really that's your pride. That's your pride, even in your insecurity saying, no, God, you're wrong. I'm actually not lovable. You got it wrong. Uh, hello, this is God. He don't get it wrong. So if he says that you're lovable, then you are period full stop. And maybe that's a journey that you need to go on in order to really see that and embrace that. And for you to find a way to love yourself if for no other reason than because God loves you. Can you love yourself as an image bearer, as someone who was created in God's image? Because God does. What was I even saying? How did we even get there? Oh, we have to find some balance. (laughs) We have to find some balance. Uh, If we think so little of ourselves that we don't believe we deserve God's presence at all in our life, then we might we might find ourselves rejecting God's presence and God's intervention in our life. And we don't want to do that. We definitely don't want to do that. 
But if we think so much of ourselves that we do not acknowledge God's authority in our life, then we don't want to do that either. So we need to be able to come to a place where we accept and acknowledge our our inherent value because God has deemed us valuable. Um, And we need to see that enough so that we can put the energy into caring for ourselves, for our body, for our mind, for our spirit, because we uh, are because our because we are a temple for the Holy Spirit and so that we can allow the Holy Spirit to work through us in service to other people. That's how it has to go. But this mindset of if I care about myself then that means I don't care about other people, that's incorrect and that's misguided. Or if I care about other people then I can't care about myself, also misguided. Also misguided because the other, the other person who I deem worthy of love, they are no more worthy of love than I am. And so when we do that, when we place people on a pedestal in that way, then that's, that's not pleasing to God and that's not what he wants either. That verse that talks about thinking of, of others higher than, your, than yourself, I, hold on, I'm going to find it because, okay, here it is. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself. I don't believe that that means that other people are more valuable than you are. And that's how we have misinterpreted this. Other people are not more valuable than you are, and you are not more valuable than other people. But when we talk about service and servanthood and why we're actually here and our purpose, our purpose is to serve others above serving ourselves. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that they are more important or more valuable or more worthy than you are. I really need us to get that in our spirit. It's, it's two sides of the same token. They're not more valuable than you are and you are not more valuable than they are. So find some, find some balance there. Uh, it's not me or them. It's both. It's not either or it's, it's yes. And it is that we are all worthy and valuable and that no one is more worthy or valuable or more called than anyone else. The devil will have you think of something different, but, but that's what God says about it. Okay. That was not our scripture of the day. <laughs> We have several scriptures uh, today because I already had two other ones that I wanted us to look at (laughs) and that that was just a bonus. So um, our first scripture of today is James 4 and verse 6, which says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. So that says, and that means that if you are someone who is so proud and you're very prideful, then there's no grace in that. Why is God going to offer you grace if you are in a position where you feel like you don't need him? Why would he give you grace if you don't think you need him? If you don't think you need his grace? And then our second verse is Romans twelve three, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So when we think about ourselves, we're not to think of ourselves as higher than other people, but that we should be always looking at ourselves through a lens of righteous judgment. We have a responsibility to make sure that the way that we are living our lives and the things that we believe and the way that we're acting and treating other people is in alignment with the way that God has called us to be as disciples of his. We are responsible to that and we are held to that standard and we have to still hold ourselves to that standard. So we aren't to think of ourselves as higher than other people. People. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves to other people. We should be concerned. We should be comparing ourselves to Christ. And when we're comparing ourselves to Christ, we're always going to fall short. That's always going to keep us humble. <laughs> if we compare ourselves to Christ, that's always going to keep us humble because we're never going to be able to reach that and to match that level of perfection. So we're always striving towards that, but we have to know that we are always going to make mistakes, that we are indeed flawed and that we're never going to reach that. So we shouldn't think of ourselves as more highly than others, that we should consider ourselves with that sound judgment and comparing ourselves to the, the ultimate example that we have because the more humble we are, the more we look like Christ and the more God is pleased. God gives grace to the humble and he opposes the proud. What does that mean that God opposes the proud? He is in opposition. When you allow your pride to get the best of you, then you are now in opposition with God. You are God's opponent. Ooh, you are God's opponent. 
when you allow that pride to take root and to grow so much where you are denying God's authority in your life. Think about that for a second. Being in opposition with God, meaning like you're fighting against God at that moment. Y'all not on the same team. Okay, that's what the pride will do. That's what that pride will do. It will make you not be on the same team as God. You're now working against him, fighting against him. Huh? No, 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 no. Mm-mm. Because I'm going to lose every time. <laughs> if I'm fighting against God, I'm going to lose every time. I don't want God as my opponent. I need him as my ally. Okay? Because I'm going to fall short every single time. There are more warnings against the proud and the rich in the Bible than pretty much anyone else. That speaks volumes, I think. There is no room for pride in Christ. We have to humble ourselves daily because this world will tell us otherwise, especially if you do have a lot of accolades. And a lot of us are very successful. Praise God, we're very successful. But if we allow this world to tell us that those successes make us more valuable than we actually are, more valuable than anyone else, and especially more valuable than God, then we are in a very, very dark place and we need to be humbled swiftly and expeditiously. So pray for humility. And if you don't think you need to pray for humility, then you need to pray for humility. (laughs) Okay. Um, let's get into our question of the day. Just as a reminder, if you have a question that you want to be answered on the show, you can send me an email at therapyandprayer at gmail.com. You can leave me a comment on social media at therapy and prayer, or you can drop it in the comments wherever you are listening or watching this. Today's question says, what do you do when you're already a loner and God also has you in a season of isolation and things are just heavy and you're seeking him, but trying not to be ungrateful? Okay, so a couple a couple of things with this question. This question is like multifaceted. So there's like a couple different parts of it. So the first part says, what do you do when you're already a loner and God has you in a season of isolation? So when when people call themselves loners or they're like, I don't like people, I don't or I, or I don't have friends, I think that there are two different ways that that can happen. One is by choice and two is by circumstance. Now, for a lot of people, it's by choice. A lot of us, like we talked about earlier, Uh, We don't want to embrace the vulnerability to let people in, right? So if you are a loner by choice because you don't let people get close to you, then I think that this season of isolation might be an invitation for you to really embrace a new level of vulnerability. Trust God to to comfort and, and protect you and to strengthen you enough to embrace that level of vulnerability to allow people to get close to you and to create a community of like-minded people around you. Sometimes I think we, we wear it as a badge of honor. I don't do people. I don't like people. I don't have people. And we wear it as a badge of honor. Like we're very proud actually that people aren't close to us and that we don't let people get close to us. But then at the same time, when we are in these seasons of isolation, we feel like, how come nobody is here? Why doesn't anybody care enough about me? So I think that we have to do some reflection and ask yourself, did you create some of the isolation? Did you create some of the isolation by keeping people at so much of an arm's length that you feel like you don't really have anyone and now consider yourself to be a loner, right? That's that's one part of it. Another part of it is if, if it's by circumstance, you don't have anyone in close proximity to you or you recently uh, ended some relationships and now find yourself without any, I think that that is a different kind of isolation. And in that case, then I think that my encouragement would be for you to view this season of isolation as God's invitation for you to get to know him in a different way for you to get to know him as a friend, as a confidant, as a partner. If there were people maybe who used to who used to occupy those spaces in your life and they no longer do, then that is an invitation to allow God to occupy those spaces in your life. And I've talked about this before, but uh, you know, we have to know God in multiple ways. He is capable of being every kind of relationship to us and not just one. But if we only see him as this monolithic God who is only authoritative and not also a friend and a confidant, then we are really limiting our experience of him. And so if you're a loner by circumstance, then can you see this isolation season as an invitation from God for you to spend more time with him and for you to know him more intimately in this season? So so that's that, right? Like, is, are you a loner by choice or by circumstance? And there's some reflection that can be done on each of those. 
Now, the other part of this is talking about when you're, you're trying to be grateful, but you are having a hard time and you're, or you're trying not to be ungrateful. I think that when we feel ungrateful or disappointed for the things that God is allowing in our life, it comes down to our expectations of him. And I think this actually fits into what we're talking about sometimes. We're talking about uh, our pride and humility, and sometimes uh, there is an element of pride in our expectation. And when we get ungrateful uh, with what God is doing in our life, it's because we feel like we don't deserve it. And we feel entitled for him to move in our life in a specific way. And so when he's not doing that, we feel like it's undeserved. We feel like it is unfair and we feel like God is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And so I do think that maybe there is some room to check your pride in some of that if that is the, if that's a part of the posture that you find yourself in. Now it takes again, a level of humility to even be honest enough with yourself to assess, is there some of that? Is that a part of my disappointment? Is that a part of my uh, lack of gratitude because I feel entitled to something else happening in my life? And if so, then that's something that you need to give to God. And in this season of isolation, then that's something, or that's a, a space where God can encounter you and renew you and help you to embrace a level of humility that will say, you know, God, whatever you are or are not doing in my life, I believe is for my good because you have the authority in my life and and I do not. And so when we're in these seasons that are really trying and challenging, it can be hard to find gratitude, but that's the thing. We have to find the gratitude. It's not always going to be our default when we're in these seasons that are kind of painful and isolating. We have to seek it out, which means that sometimes it, it needs to be like manufactured and you have to maybe look at things that you wouldn't typically be grateful for, maybe the mundane things and find a way to actually see those things as a blessing. Maybe I'm a loner and I don't have any friends around me right now, or I don't have anyone that's close to me right now. Um, and I have a job that I really enjoy and I have all of my, my capacities and I'm able to use all of my limbs. And I know that there are other people who are not. So let me be grateful for that. That's not in a way to minimize what you're feeling or what you are experiencing, but that is a way for you to find God still because God is still there. Just because God is allowing you to go through a season where you feel isolated, know that he has not left you and that you're not isolated in the spiritual sense. And sometimes we have to find gratitude in order to be able to embrace God. Because if we are just frustrated and disappointed and upset with God for where he has us, then we're not going to want to lean into him while he has us there. And the best thing that you can do when you're in any season of isolation or of suffering is to lean into God, know that he is in it with you. But when we throw our temper tantrum because we don't want to be there, then it's hard for us to embrace God at all. So sometimes we have to find him in places that we wouldn't typically look just so that we can be reminded that he is still there. So if you find yourself in any season of isolation, look at it as an invitation one way or another. Is it an invitation for you to embrace vulnerability enough to let other people in so that you aren't isolated anymore? Or is it an invitation from God to get to know him more intimately and in ways that you have not known him before? And how can you embrace a spirit of gratitude? Even if where he has you, you having a hard time being grateful for that at the moment, can you be grateful for other things that he's doing in your life? Can you be grateful for the other ways that he is blessing you so that at least you can have a spirit of acceptance for where he has you? We have to get to acceptance before we can get to gratitude sometimes. So can you find gratitude elsewhere to help you embrace acceptance for where he has you? And then you can get to gratitude for where he has you. And that gratitude may not come until after he moves you out of this season. So while you're in it, if we can't get to gratefulness and to gratitude, can we get to acceptance? And that's going to help to carry you through it. Okay. I hope that was helpful. Um, Thank y'all so much for listening. That is all that I have for you today. Um, Thank you for all the support. I love y'all so, so much. You have no idea. Thank you for being here and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Therapy and Prayer. Make sure you're subscribed and following wherever you listen to podcasts. And if the spirit moves you, go ahead and leave us a review. If you want to submit a question to be answered on this show, send us an email at therapyandprayer at gmail.com and make sure you're following us on TikTok at Therapy and Prayer. Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to you soon.